please talk. I can go on for hours. Uh, but everyone is welcome to chime in if you have questions. Okay, we'll wait about one more minute for to join in. I hear someone's voice, I don't know if it's intentional. I, th I think it's background. Okay, I think we'll uh, start. Thanks everyone for joining in for the first of this year's um, IS Astrophysics seminars. Uh, Susan Clark and I are jointly organizing these um, with uh, help from the technical help from the IAS staff. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm David Weinberg. I'm here on sabbatical this year. Um, and for our first virtual seminar, we're delighted to have uh, Emmanuel Berti from, uh, from Johns Hopkins University and uh, to talk about physics with uh, gravitational wave binaries. And uh, Emmanuel got his PhD uh, 2001 from uh, University of Rome uh, and then did uh, postdocs uh, in Greece and Paris, uh, Washington University, working with Clifford Will um, and Caltech before uh, becoming a, a professor of physics at University of Mississippi, where he was for many years, uh, but in 2018 moved to uh, Johns Hopkins University, where he is now. Um, and uh, out of the uh, thousands of people who now do uh, gravitational wave physics. He's one of the very few uh, who is not part of the LIGO collaboration, um, but uh, is doing lots of, of independent theory, which he will tell us about. Uh, and for those of you who didn't get an email announcement about it, we'll have a, for those interested, a sort of follow-up uh, conversation Q&A after the talk this afternoon. Um, at two o'clock, I'll drop the Zoom link for that into the chat in a, in a few minutes. Um, but with that, uh, if everybody who's not asking a question should would mute, um, and uh, we'll turn things over to Emmanuel. Thank you so much. Just a couple of things. Uh, first of all, everyone is welcome to ask me questions. Uh, we're gonna have more time later to meet again and uh, finish going through the slides if anyone is interested. I think it's not terribly important that I go through all of the slides also because I'll never be able to. I can keep talking for hours and hours. Uh, so just uh, ask me questions if you have any and um, I'll get where I can get with my actual talk. Um, it, these are very exciting times in gravitational wave astronomy as you all know and uh, Originally, when I submitted my abstract, I wanted to talk about physics and astrophysics with gravitational wave observations of compact binaries, in particular black hole binaries. But I decided to leave all of the physics part out. We can discuss it later. If you want to hear about things like testing general relativity or um, uh, looking for dark matter with gravitational waves, that's another talk. But there has been so much going on uh, with new events from the LIGO collaboration and so on, that I decided to focus on uh, giving you a general introduction of where we stand with the events that we have detected. Uh, and uh, after spending maybe 15, 20 minutes uh, describing all of the events that LIGO has seen so far, I'll tell you about some uh, work that I've been doing with my group on uh, uh, understanding these events, and in particular, the strange ones, the ones that we didn't expect to see in the data. So um, 
This is roughly the um, uh, plan of the talk. Uh, first of all, I'll give a status update on the three observing runs of the LIGO Vergo collaboration. O1 and O2 have been out there for a very long time. Uh, the O3 catalog with all of the 50 plus events um, from the third observing run is not out yet. We're eagerly awaiting. Uh, but what is out there are a few outstanding events, um, which are outstanding because they are astrophysically unexpected, I would say. So uh, to justify why I call them astrophysically unexpected, I will tell you something about what our prior expectations were for the black holes that should have been formed through the two main traditional formation channels, field and cluster. And uh, then I'll tell you something that we've been thinking about on uh, how to address the puzzles. In particular, how can we fill what I'm going to call the mass and spin gaps? And finally, if I had time, which I doubt, I will also tell you something about what Lisa will be able to tell us. I'm involved in the uh, Lisa Consortium and in the NASA Lisa study team. Everyone who's interested in working in these topics is welcome to ask me questions, but I don't know that I will have much time to talk about this. Um, first, credit where it's due. Uh, most of the work that I'm going to describe comes from uh, students and postdocs uh, over the years. In particular, uh, these are my three postdocs at the moment. Roberto Coteste is supposed to join the group from uh, the Albert Einstein Institute in Germany uh, in the late fall, maybe spring, given what's going on in the world right now. Uh, Felix Julia is an expert in post-Newtonian theory and modified theories of gravity. Thomas Selfer is a numerical relativity postdoc working with us also on uh, binary black hole population inference and so on. I have two great students at the moment, um, both of whom want to graduate in the spring. So they're going to be on the market and I will advertise some of their work. Um, and uh, uh, much of this work has also been done with previous students of mine, in particular David Gerosa, who is now um, a, a faculty in Birmingham in the UK and won the yeah. Wake Prize for um, gravitational waves Could in I 2016. Use the pencil? Yes, yeah. sure. I'm sorry, I told you I have an elementary school kid. Um, and uh, uh, also, uh, Hector Okada da Silva, who was my student in Mississippi, and Shrobana Ghosh, who is now a postdoc in Cardiff. So, um, while everybody is uh, uh, still paying attention, I want to tell you a couple of facts about black hole binaries that are very important for what I'm going to say later on. And the, the two facts that I want to stress are these. Um, those of you doing general relativity already know these things very well, but I want to make it clear because it's a key element in understanding the LIGO events. The first thing that I want to say is that if you take two black holes, which are non-spinning, going around each other, and you merge them, these two black holes typically have a lot of orbital angular momentum. And uh, when you make them merge and you produce a final black hole, the final black hole is going to be rotating. And we know from numerical relativity simulations that were done back in 2005 or so, among others by Franz Pretorius, who is now with you guys, we know that the final spin of the black hole that you form in this way is going to be around 0 0.7 in dimensionless curve units. So if you take two black holes that are non spinning and you merge, then you're going to get a black hole that spins pretty fast. The second thing that has been known more or less since 2005, 2006, is that when you merge two black holes, if those two black holes have an equal masses, they are going to recoil. And they're going to recoil by conservation of linear momentum. Basically, you can think of the two of them as a sprinkler. And if you turn off the sprinkler at the moment of merger, by conservation of momentum, the band is going to recoil in the direction opposite to the direction in which gravitational waves are preferentially emitted. Uh, however, this effect is not dominant. This recoil can be up to about 200 kilometers per second. Uh, if your black holes are spinning instead, and in particular if they are in the so-called super K configuration, uh, something more interesting is going to happen. And the something more interesting is that 
You can imagine each of the two black holes as being a little tornado dragging space time around it. So as they go around, when they are in this configuration, this black hole will drag the other black hole down and same, this black hole will drag this black hole down. And when they're on the opposite side of the orbit, the opposite thing will happen. So the battery will bob up and down. And for the same reason as in the sprinkler analogy, when the two black holes finally merge, they're going to recoil in the direction of orthogonal to the orbital plane. But this recoil can be much larger of the order of thousands of kilometers per second, in fact, up to 5,000. Now, I'm saying all of this right now because uh, these two very basic facts are central to understanding where black holes were formed. If you get a very large recoil and you want your black holes to form in a globular cluster, then you'd better have your black holes non-spinning because if they are spinning, you're gonna kick them out and you won't be able to merge them again, okay? So this very basic kind of reasoning is something that I'm gonna bring up later on. So what have we seen so far? Uh, in the 01 and 02 runs of LIGO and Virgo, we have seen first uh, three black hole binaries merging, then seven more and one binary neutron star. These according to the official uh, LIGO-Virgo counts. And here you see all of the different events. They are labeled by their detection date. So the first historic one was in September 2015. And then uh, we had many others. And finally, we had the famous binary neutron star 170817 with the electromagnetic counterparts and so on. But we mostly focus on binary black holes. Uh, now that we have seen all of these events, we know many things that we didn't know before. For example, we know for sure the black holes merge in the universe. We have some rough estimate of the rate at which they merge, which is about 20 and 60 per gigaparsec cube per year depending on the way you model the mass distribution of these binaries uh, in the local universe. We also have rough estimates for the merger rate of binary neutron stars. And in the 0102 runs, we had not seen any black hole neutron star binary. Now we know that we have seen them in 03, but um, I can only show what's official. And so I can only show you upper limits on the merger rates of the neutron star black hole binaries from the known detection in the original events. There is also some very mild evidence that these rates are evolving with redshift, which you would expect if you um, imagine that these black holes and neutron stars are produced from stellar collapse, and therefore they should somehow follow a star formation rate in the universe, maybe have a peak around redshift two or so, and then drop off again. The other thing that we know is that we have measured a bunch of masses and spins. Uh, here you see the masses of the component black holes. Um, when you see a banana shape, it's because the system is low mass. So you see mostly the early in spiral and what you measure is a certain combination of the two masses that is called the chirp mass. And so you have a very thin line in the direction of the chirp mass and a very long line over here. But as the mass of the system increases, you see more and more of the merger. And so you can measure the total mass of the system better and better. And then we also have the final masses and spins. Uh, now, out of the events in the first or one or two catalog, uh, one was special because it was at the edge of the pair instability supernova, position of pair instability supernova gap. Uh, we don't know exactly where that edge is, but we believe that when stars collapse um, above a certain initial mass of the star, which is of order 100 solar masses or so, uh, you should have pair production of electron positrons that depletes the pressure in the star. Therefore, your star does not collapse to a black hole, but it either bounces in a position of pair instability supernova or eject all of the material in a pair instability supernova? Yes, do you have questions? Uh, maybe not. And uh, what, you, what you get is that you shouldn't have any black holes of mass larger than about 50 solar masses, if you believe this story, okay? Um, so, um, in fact, the LIGO collaboration looked at the events in the 0102 uh, catalog and they tried to model the mass function using different phenomenological functional forms. And they seem to find some marginal evidence that there is a fall off in the mass distribution of the primary black hole 
around 40 to 50 solar masses. This was the story at least until a few weeks ago. Now, of course, um, people like Matias uh, Zaldariaga in this group at Princeton and others had been reanalyzing the LIGO data, which are now public. And uh, that's a very good thing because by reanalyzing the LIGO data, they identified several other candidates up to eight, uh, maybe more, maybe less, depending on the way you assess your confidence intervals. And some of those events seem to be inside the mass gap. So whether you believe they are astrophysical or not is up to you. And uh, people have been discussing, but it's very interesting that we're pushing this per instability supernova mass limit with the events that we're seeing. Um, I have to say the Princeton group was not the only one to reanalyze the LIGO data. Another group is the Syracuse group, uh, NITS, Duncan Brown, and others. What is interesting is that they also looked at the catalog. This is basically the same catalog that I've shown you before. And the events that they marked with the yellow squares here are the same events to which the Princeton group assigned a very large probability of being astrophysical in origin. So I would say those are pretty solid uh, black hole candidates. And uh, they also saw events that are pushing the edge of the per instability supernova gap. So maybe something is going on there. In fact, now the LIGO collaboration has been taking data much longer and they have um, a public catalog that you can access at the web pages down here, which now consists, according to the Wikipedia page that I used to put together these numbers of 36 black hole, black hole, five neutron star, neutron star candidates, four neutron star black hole, and five events that are classified as mass gap. I will tell you more about what mass gap means. So I'm sorry, I wonder if I can ask a question there. I'm sorry, no, you, you quoted Wikipedia. So is this an official statement from the collaboration or is this a rumor that somebody typed into Wikipedia or exactly? No, what? it's not a rumor. Uh, so the way it works is that uh, um, I'll show you. Um, so the in this page, if you go to the page, there is a catalog of events, which are mm -hmm. uh, cataloged by when they came out. Uh, and uh, the collaboration gives everyone a sky map, which can be used for the follow-up observations in the electromagnetic spectrum. And uh, it gives a classification of the events. So I'll tell you how this classification works in two slides. But basically they say whether the events are expected to be black hole, black hole, neutron star black hole, or mass gap, where mass gap is a certain definition that I will give you in a minute. Gotcha. So Thank it's you. an official statement. We don't know for sure that the final analysis will tell us that they are neutron star black hole, for example, but that's what the initial uh, detection algorithm classified them as. Okay. So, um, exactly to the point, what is given in these public announcements? The first thing that is given is the sky localization of the source. Um, gravitational wave detectors are very poor at localizing a source. If you take a single detector, uh, imagine that a gravitational wave is going through the detector. If it goes through the detector along the z-axis and your detector is in the xy plane, it will stretch and squeeze both arms of the detector. So you're maximally sensitive to gravitational waves that come from above and below. But if your gravitational wave is coming through the xy plane, then it will only preferentially squeeze and stretch one of the two arms. And so you are less sensitive if the gravitational wave is coming through the plane, okay? So this gives you the characteristic peanut shape of the sensitivity of a gravitational wave detector. However, when you have multiple detectors, you can combine the time of arrivals from two detectors to build a circle in the sky. And if you have three detectors, you can combine two circles to get two points. Those are not exactly two points because of the peanut shape of each of the detectors. So you'll get the one of the two points is gonna be favored over the other. But typically the shape of the localization region is gonna look like a ring if you only have two detectors on, more like a banana maybe. And if you have three detectors on, it will look like two spots in the sky 
with one of the two being favored over the other, okay? So that's exactly what these sky maps look like. This, for example, is an event where uh, there were uh, two detectors on, and so you see the banana in the sky. You see, it's not quite a perfect banana, but almost. The other thing that LIGO tells you is whether the uh, members of the binary system were black holes, neutron stars, or possibly something else. And the um, official definition is that you call something a black hole when uh, the mass inferred from the gravitational waves is larger than five solar masses. You call it a neutron star when the mass is less than three solar masses. That's because from equational state considerations, we know that we cannot build a neutron star more massive than three, in fact, maybe 2.5. So you want to be safe. If an object has a mass between three and five, they call it mass gap. If at least one of the objects has a mass between three and five, they call it a mass gap event. Okay, this is the classification. Uh, good, so what's gonna come up next? More detectors. Uh, the Japanese have already joined the network uh, with CAGRA, which is low sensitivity. The first lock happened in August. The sensitivity is still not really good enough to add an additional sensitive node to the network and localizing the sources much better, but they're working really hard and they're going to get there very soon. LIGO India is also um, under planning and construction. In fact, Matthias and I are involved in some uh, uh, US Indo collaboration with the Indians, and we expect that in the next few years something interesting is going to come from over there. Um, now, let me go to the newer and more interesting stuff. O3, uh, the full O3 catalog is not out yet. However, some interesting events have been announced. And I just want to give you a very short overview of what has been announced so far before I move on to the astro theorist interpretation of what is going on. One event that I will not discuss again in the rest of my talk was another binary neutron star. Unfortunately, we did not see the electromagnetic counterpart of this event, but it's still very interesting because the masses of this binary neutron star system are larger than any known galactic binary neutron star we have observed so far. So something's at play there, another uh, neutron star modeler, but this is something that people will have to think about. Is there more than one population of binary neutron stars? Is this perfectly normal? Uh, are uh, X-ray binary is a different population. You know, these are all open questions for astrophysical modelers. A second event that I will talk about later in my talk, because I have something to say about it, is GW1904-12. This event uh, was interesting in two ways. First of all, unlike most of the events that have been observed in 01 and 02, it did not have a mass ratio that is very close to unity. This event had a mass ratio of about three. And uh, that is very interesting because we have, when you have a binary black hole with a mass ratio that is very different from unity, you can excite higher harmonics of the gravitational waves. And maybe you can use that to do tests of general relativity, which I will not discuss in my talk by choice. But Besides having a very large mass ratio compared to all the others, this event also had a primary black hole spin that was definitely non-zero within the 90% confidence interval. So here you have a system in which you have to explain a primary spin that is definitely non-zero. Remember, large spin means that it's quite likely to eject the black hole if it's formed in a dense environment. And you also have a large mass ratio, which is very hard to make for standard stellar evolution. So can we explain this event using traditional formation scenarios, or do we need to come up with something creative? This is something that I will discuss later on. Yet another event that was announced because it was special is GW1908-14. Here, the mass ratio is even larger 
it's 10, not 3, about 10. And uh, even more interestingly, the large black hole has a mass of about 23, and the small guy has a mass of 2.6. Now, go figure out you make a 2.6 or mass compact object, because it's just slightly too large for being a binary neutron star. We have a paper with Hector Okada da Silva, one of my students, and Justin Austin, who was a postdoc at CCA, where we argue that from the binary neutron star distribution that we have already observed, the upper limit on uh, the mass of individual neutron stars should be something like maybe 2.3 at most. 2.6 is really hard to make, given everything we know about neutron stars. So what is it? Is it a very high mass neutron star? Is it a rotating neutron star that is supported by rotation? Or is it a very low mass black hole? Can we tell? Now, I have a couple of papers on this. This is an object that is filling the lower mass gap, but once again, I have to make choices. If you're interested in discussing this, we can talk about it this afternoon, but I'm not gonna say much about this event in the rest of my talk. The last and last and greatest, latest and greatest of the events that were announced in 03 is called GW190521. And it's very interesting, very, very interesting because uh, the best estimate of the individual black hole masses are 86 and 66. So both of the objects, by the definition of the upper mass gap that I gave you before, could not have been formed in, from stellar collapse. Now there's uncertainties. You may argue, maybe we don't know where the upper mass gap really is. You can add 15, 16 solar masses of uncertainty from unknown nuclear reactions. You can add 20 solar masses of uncertainty from possible other mechanisms that would accrete matter onto the black hole um, in certain scenarios. But 86 is really hard to make with stellar collapse. So how do we explain this event? And the event was also widely advertised as being the first detection of an intermediate mass black hole. If you like your intermediate mass black holes to be larger than 100, some of you may like to call an intermediate mass black hole something as a much larger than 10 to the 3. So whatever, the, the mass of the remnant was definitely much larger than anything we knew. The other thing that was interesting about this event is that if you look at the LIGO paper, the best estimates for the mass of the two components are 0 0.7. Now, remember what I told you in the very first slide when you were still interested in what I was saying? 0 0.7 is what you get from the merger of previous black holes. So if you have two black holes that have a mass of 0 0.7 and uh, they cannot have been made by stellar collapse, then maybe these guys are really merging multiple times. And they give you mean you spin, spin, right? The spin is 0 0.7 for each of the two. The estimates are very uncertain, uh, very uncertain, but the masses are larger than what you can make by collapse, and the spins are consistent with what you would make from previous mergers. So we need to think about whether these events really came from previous mergers. And here is a plot from the LIGO astrophysical interpretation paper. By the way, all of these purple things that you see at the bottom are archive numbers. And you see that the two black guys with error bars here are the primary and secondary component masses. And you cannot make this primary from stellar collapse. What you see on the right are models by Michela Mapelli's group in Padua. You can believe your own favorite modeler, but it's really hard to make a black hole of mass, 86 solar masses. There's a log scale here. Um, the other part of the story that I want to discuss when I talk about my own work, which will start in the next slide, is the spins. The uh, story that has been told by the... Can, can I ask a question before you move on from this event? Yes, yes. Uh, do, do you want... To, th this event had the claimed electromagnetic... Uh, ah. Do you want to comment on this or say anything? Sure. 
Um, so it had a claim, the electromagnetic counterpart, that the claim by Graham et al. was that um, this was indeed the second generation black hole. They didn't know the masses at the time and they didn't know the distance because they did their analysis relatively blind. They only knew what was announced by O3. And uh, they uh, tried to associate this event with an AGN. It turns out that the actual distance of the event, as published by the LAGO collaboration in the paper that eventually came out, is larger than the distance to the AGN corresponding to the claimed association. The LIGO papers are very scant on details. Uh, they don't say much about the other papers. So I would say that right now the onus is on them to prove that the association still stands. I would say that I spoke with some people who are skeptic, but I'm not a modeler. And so that's all I had to say about this. Okay. Thank you. Um, the spin story. So uh, most of the events that were detected by the LIGO collaboration uh, were associated with an effective spin that is close to zero. To explain what I'm showing in these violin plots, uh, the effective spin is basically a mass-weighted combination. So imagine that you had the two black hole spins with spin one and spin two, and uh, uh, you take the projection of these two spins onto the direction of the orbital and your momentum, and you construct M1 spin one plus M2 spin two divided by the total mass. That's called the effective spin. Projected onto L. So if this guy is zero, let me say it over and over again because I had to defend this point over and over again. This doesn't mean that the spins are zero. This means that they could be like this, it means that they could be like this, or it means that they could both be small, but we don't know. Besides, the way these spins are measured is very sensitive to details of the data analysis, as Matthias and his group know very well, and they depend on the prior. So if you have a preference for formation in clusters, you might imagine that if these black holes are coming together dynamically, their spin orientations may be random. So this configuration will be pretty likely. But if you want to form your black holes from field binaries, typically you would expect the black holes to be maybe a little misaligned, but preferentially aligned with the orbital and your momentum for uh, reasons that I will explain in a minute. So, as you can see, there's at least a couple of events for which the spins are clearly non-zero. And any claim that all of the spins are zero from this event is great, from these observations is greatly exaggerated. That's all I want to say. Okay. And I will get back to this and, and say more about what I really think about this later on. But because there was a lot of talk of the spins being small, of course, people came up with explanations why the spins are small. In particular, there was work by uh, Jim Fuller and students at Caltech where they tried to uh, understand what kind of spins would result from stellar collapse. And if you believe their models, they, can, they came up with the conclusion that black hole spins resulting from stellar collapse will always be smaller than about 0.01. These dots are the simulations. These are the LIGO observations, including also the IAS black hole mergers, which have a larger spin, if you believe the data analysis by the IAS group. Um, so this is, if you like, theoretical support to the idea that black holes from, formed from collapse should have small spin. What you see on the right is a combination of the evidence from all of the LIGO events by Will Farr's group at CCA, where they claim that if you take all of the events together, you have to conclude that the mean of the effective spin is basically zero with a very small variance below 0.07, they say in the paper. So 
This is observational support to the idea that the spins may actually be small. Now, I don't want to completely buy into this idea, but if these theoretical and, and observational arguments are correct, then we may think that if you form a black hole from stellar collapse, there should be a spin gap, not only a mass gap. If you believe these people, it should be impossible to form black holes with a spin larger than some maximum value from stellar collapse alone. So let me, later on, I will try to push this idea to its logical consequences, okay? All right, this plot is only eye candy. I will not say much about it, but let me go to the modeler's perspective. What were our expectations? So, first of all, I want to debunk the idea that in the field formation scenario, you always produce binaries that are perfectly aligned. Let's start from the most conservative assumption, which is whenever you have two stars, the two stars will have angular momenta, which are aligned with the orbital angular momentum. This is not always true. There is observational evidence why it's not always true which goes under the catchy name banana. Binaries are not always neatly aligned. And uh, there's a whole um, set of people doing experiments uh, using the so-called rossiter mclaughlin effect, of which I know nothing, so don't ask me about it. But there's arguments why this may not be true. But let's be conservative. So let's say that you start with two stars that are perfectly aligned with the orbit and your momentum. What's going to happen is that one of the two stars will evolve out of the main sequence, and then uh, possibly it will expand, possibly it will transfer mass to the companion. You'll be left with a helium core. The helium core will explode. There will be some fraction of mass transfer that may or may not spin up the other guy. So now you have a helium core. This helium core explodes and the explosion in general is going to be asymmetric. Because the explosion is asymmetric, this battery will be kicked. Now, if the kick is very large, you may disrupt the binary and you will never observe anything in LIGO because you are left with an unbound system. But if the kick is small enough, your system will stay bound. But now the two spins will be misaligned with respect to the orbital angular momentum because no one tells you that the kick is in the direction of the orbital plane. So you're going to be misaligned a little bit. Now you have a black hole here and you have a star, puffy large star, which will transfer mass and during the mass, uh, sorry, which will may or may not tidally align with the companion because of the tides exerted by the black hole into the star. So if it does, then you will have some degree of misalignment between your black hole here and your star here. Now this star is evolving. It expands, leaves behind a helium core, helium core explodes. But during the expansion, you often will have a common envelope that will shrink the binary. So at the time of the second supernova, your system will be much tighter and will be much harder to disrupt from the kick that the other guy gets. So that's the story, that's the story. You can have misalignment that comes either from the kicks or from tidal interactions. Good. Now, we don't know much about any of this, do we? So what we did was we took simulations, population synthesis simulations produced by Chris Belchinski with Star Trek, and we put the spin in there in the best way we could. We have a whole machine to evolve the spins using post-Newtonian equations of motion, what have you. We include uh, prescriptions for the natal spins uh, that are either uniform uh, between uh, zero and one, or they are maximized to see the maximum effect of the spins, or they follow another collapse model that you are free to believe or not, uh, where you assume that the spins are going to decrease as the mass gets large. Okay, it's, it's a model. You, you don't have to believe it. And then we assume that either tides are efficient or not, at realigning the star, the second guy that goes boom, okay? 
And then we feed all of this into a detectability algorithm and we see how many of these events are going to be detected. Now, some things that you may expect are that if your typical supernova kicks are large, this is measured by sigma, which is a parameter in a Maxwellian distribution of spins that we tune. If the kicks are large, many binaries are going to be disrupted and so your rates will go down. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. Also, the kind of binary that you will observe depends on the particular formation history in the Star Trek catalogs that we get. The story that I told you is not the only possible story. You may have black hole one goes boom, common envelope happens, black hole two goes boom, or you may have black hole two goes boom, where the label refers to the star that will produce the largest black hole now, because mass transfer may swap the original primary if mass transfer is very efficient, you see? So you may have black hole two goes boom, common envelope, black hole one goes boom, and so on. All of these scenarios will give you different traits and they will give you different probabilities uh, of alignment. So typically, I would say the distribution that you may expect to get is something like the green one here, where you will have some degree of misalignment, chi effective will be preferentially positive, but you will also have a tail, which is not negligible, of events with negative chi effective. So the LIGO observations are definitely not consistent with this because they are centered around zero. Is it an effect of the prior that they use? I don't know, but they are not consistent with all of the binaries coming from field. Uh, in fact, you can use the fraction of binaries with negative chi effective to infer information on things like whether tides matter, whether black hole kicks are small or large, and so on. Here I show you the probability of having a negative chi effective in different models. And you see that the tides matter, but the spin magnitude that you assume doesn't matter so much, as long as the spins are non zero. If they are zero, you, you give them zero, you get zero at the end, right? So this is to tell you that the story is more nuanced than what is usually told. Now, this was my fairy tale version of the field formation uh, scenario. Now I'm going to give you my fairy tale version of the cluster formation scenario. In the cluster formation scenario, you have the following things happen. Typically, you have many black holes sinking to the center. This is something that was explored by Cole Miller and collaborators back in the early 2000s. And, uh, um, by mass segregation, basically conservation of energy in a cluster, you're going to get a lot of massive black holes at the center of a cluster. Uh, these black holes typically will uh, pair with other black holes of comparable mass because the higher the mass, the more likely they are to be at the center of the cluster, the, the more likely they are to meet with each other. So you would expect that typically, um, many black holes that are formed in this way are going to be comparable mass, which makes it hard to explain some of the events that I talked about before. But if this happens, then the two black holes will merge. Remember slide number one, if they merge, they're going to have a spin of 0 0.7, even if their initial spins were small. And then they have to merge again. But if they have to merge again, now at least one of the two black holes has a large spin. So when it tries to merge with the other guy, it will get a big kick and the big kick will eject binaries from the cluster. So you can only play this game so many times. Getting a 2G plus 2G merger is gonna be pretty hard, pretty hard. And we can quantify how hard it is. So in a first paper on this with uh, Davide Gerosa, my, my ex-student, we try to understand the bulk properties of the distribution that would make the second generation scenario look different from the first generation scenario. We came up with a few broad ideas. One is that if you start from any distribution of 1G black hole, let me call them 1G black hole, the ones that are formed from stellar collapse, and you let them merge again, typically the new second generation black holes will have higher masses that you can expect, right? You're merging 1G black holes, you get black holes of higher mass. They will have a mass ratio that is preferentially closer to one 
which you can also expect by the argument I gave you one minute ago. And uh, typically, this black holes will have to merge closer to you because it takes more time to first make the 1G black holes out of collapse and then to merge them, right? Besides, their chi effective distributions, even if you believe the story that all the black holes born from collapse are zero, will look broader because you, you start with a very broad distribution around zero and as you merge them, you will get some black holes that have non-zero spins. So your distribution will tend to become broader around zero, even if you start from zero. Okay, now this is very broadly what you can expect. Now, what is interesting is that you can go to the LIGO events and you can ask, can I infer something about the formation environment of binary black holes from the observations. Here I give you one example. Suppose that you start with black holes that are all non-spinning. So focus on the blue histogram where you have kinax equal to zero. Now, when you have kinax equal to zero, if you take a population of black holes and you let them merge once, you will only get kicks that are at most of order 200 kilometers per second. Because when the black holes are non-spinning, slide number one, your final kick can be at most as large as about 200 kilometers per second. However, give these black holes the possibility to merge one more time and your distribution of kick velocities will develop a second peak. How large that second peak is depends on <clears throat> how often you can retain the black holes in the cluster. So if the escape velocity from your cluster is tiny, say 10 kilometers per second, the second peak will be very small. If the escape velocity is large, say 200, you will retain more often and the second peak will get larger, right? So th the story is telling you that even if you start from zero spins, it's quite unlikely that you will get a lot of second generation events in a cluster because typical escape velocities from clusters are of order 10 to maybe 50, maybe 100 kilometers per second, but not more than that. So whenever you have an event that is in the second peak, you're going to eject. So you can use this information, the gravitational wave observables to determine the probability that a second generation black hole was formed in a cluster or not. What you see here is exactly playing that game. As a function of the maximum spin of black holes of first generation, we ask what is the probability that I will see one black hole in the mass gap if these black holes are formed by repeated mergers when I observe, say, 50 events, which is the number that we have seen in LIGO. Well, the probability being smaller than 2% implies that your environment must have an escape velocity less than 100 kilometers per second if the pairing of black holes is random, which I would say is unrealistic, or less than 50 kilometers per second if the pairing is selective, which means that heavy black holes preferentially meet heavy black holes, okay? So you get, it, it gets really, really unlikely to make these guys from globular clusters if you observe many of them in 50 LIGO observations. This is what I'm trying to drive home. Now, let's go back to that mass ratio three event because that was a good candidate for a second generation event. Remember, the primary has a spin that is definitely non-zero and the mass ratio is of order three, which makes it pretty hard to make from stellar evolution alone of isolated field binaries. So what we did was we went back to those catalogs of black holes um, that were formed uh, from the Star Trek simulations. And we said, we don't wanna do any fine tuning. Let's just take the catalogs we already have and let's ask, how many binaries in our catalog are within the 90% confidence intervals 
of GW1904.12. And we just plotted this number as a function of sigma. Remember, sigma is the kick magnitude when the black hole collapses. If that number is large, you're not going to have many binaries. If that number is small, uh, uh, you're going to have more detectable binaries, but you're also going to have uh, very little misalignment. So we found that the probability of finding one black hole in the existing Star Trek catalogs that were not tuned to the new observation was of order one part in 10 to the four. Now go and make one of these guys out of 10 or 50 observations. It's pretty hard. So maybe it was actually second generation. So we can go and take a most simple minded form of second generation catalogs and ask, how often will I find in a second generation catalog a black hole that is compatible yada yada with the features of GW1904.12? Well, it depends on whether your pairing is selective or random, but the probability is still pretty small. If you have random pairing, which again I would argue is unlikely, then it will happen about once every a thousand observations. If your pairing is selective, much worse, because typically you should expect the mass ratio to be close to one, not three. And so th this thing shouldn't be there unless you imagine that it's coming from an environment with, where the escape velocity is much larger. In fact, what we did was we said, if we insist that the event is 1G plus 1G, the fact that chi effective is definitely non-zero requires you to have a maximum natal black hole spin that is large enough. Otherwise, you cannot make it through a 1G plus 1G. If you want it to be second generation, then the fact that you had to retain it implies that the escape velocity has to be large enough, in fact, larger than 150 kilometers per second, which makes the cluster interpretation pretty much impossible. So it could well be a second generation event, but you had to produce it maybe in a nuclear star cluster, maybe in an AGN, come up with something clever and creative, because a standard globular cluster is probably not going to cut it. Triples, if you like triples, whatever, you know. Okay, now, how much time do I have? About five minutes. Mm -hmm. and we'll go to questions. Okay, I will use the last five minutes to talk about um, uh, what I think is a pretty nice paper that we wrote with my student Vishal and uh, Davide Gerosa and Case and um, all of my group here, where we took seriously the idea of the spin gap. Okay. So remember, the mass gap tells you that if you have 1G plus 1G black holes, they will merge somehow, but you should not see any mergers above whatever threshold. It may not be as sharp as we draw it here, but whatever sh threshold is established by the pair instability supernova mechanism. So if you see any black holes that have a mass larger than 50, they should come from second generation, maybe 2G plus 1G, maybe 2G plus 2G, we don't know. But you are filling this mass gap by repeated mergers. Now, suppose that you believe the story that 1G plus 1G black holes have small spins. This means that if I measure the effective spin, defined as I told you before, the effective spin should always be consistent with zero, unless your black hole is coming from a repeated merger, because then the first time you merge them, you get 0 0.7. When you merge them again, if you have a 2G plus 1G scenario, your distribution is gonna become broader. So you will fill the spin gap. Imagine that you draw a line here at chi max, the maximum value of the natal spin allowed by first generation. The only possibility to see events where chi effective is larger than that is if they are coming from a repeated merger. So there is going to be some efficiency, let me call it lambda, with which cluster events can fill the gap. Okay? 
not all scenarios are born equal. So there will be some efficiency, which we computed using a model that you may hate or think is completely oversimplified, whatever. We find that this mixing fraction is maybe 5% to fill the mass gap and about 14% to fill the spin gap under certain assumptions, okay? Now, uh, now, what I want to understand is if I see events that are filling either the mass gap or the spin gap or both, can I understand something about the formation scenario of these black holes? And to draw any conclusions, I need to come up with a model. So my student, all by himself, I'm not a real astrophysicist, even though I pretend to be good at, uh, at making people believe that I am. Uh, I'm a general relativity person, but Vishal, he, he put together a simple semi-analytic model to compute the total time scale for the production of a binary that would be detectable by LIGO in a dense environment. So you start from some 1G plus 1G population, your black holes will mass segregate and sink to the center, then they will form a binary. How do they form a binary? They can form a binary either from three body interactions, where you know the two more massive black holes in any given triple bind together and the lightest is, is ejected, or through binary single exchanges, because you're gonna have several binaries in the center. So you have black hole plus star star system, you have an exchange, becomes black hole plus star with another star. Now the black hole plus star means meets another interloping black hole. There's another exchange and you have black hole black holes plus a star. Uh, this is a subdominant channel. You can compute the time scales for all these things to happen. They will leave you in the end with a black hole binary. Now, by Hegley's law, a hard binary, one for which the gravitational binding energy is large compared to the typical velocity dispersion, blah, blah. Uh, uh, for a, a hard binary, it tends to get harder. But also, um, a hard binary tends to be ejected more. It's, it's more likely to be ejected because the escape velocity from the cluster scales like one over square root of A. So you need to put all of these ingredients together. When your binary gets compact enough, gravitational radiation reaction is gonna take over, you will merge in LIGO. If not, bad luck. So you can go and look at all the different time scales and ask yourself, how often are my binaries gonna be ejected? And what you find is that they tend to be ejected when the black holes are small, and they tend to be ejected when the clusters are small. If the cluster is small, a tiny escape velocity is going to be enough to kick you out. If the black holes are small, you're going to get large recoils, you're going to be kicked out. So we built the simplest thing we could. We assumed the power law distribution for the cluster masses. We took the 1G population to be given by the one observationally measured by LIGO. We assumed that the star formation rate uh, gives you information on how often these things are gonna form as a function of redshift. And then we asked, given some 1G, 1G population of binaries that merge in this cluster, how often will they remain in the cluster so that they can merge again in C2? And how often will I observe second generation mergers? That depends on the maximum spin of the first generation black holes. The larger it is, the more often I'm going to kick them out by relativistic recoils, not the Hegley's law recoils. Nice. So now the scheme that we came up with is the following. Assume that the large majority of your black holes are actually 1G plus 1G, and you have a small contamination of the 2G population. You can use the LIGO observations to infer the value of chi maximum, that's exactly the game that Will Farr and his group played. Then suppose that you have a max, chi max is the maximum black hole spin formed from stellar collapse. From our model, you can associate that chi max to an efficiency of filling the gap, call it lambda, okay? The efficiency of filling the gap tells you how often will I find an event in the gap 
given that there are n events that belong to the cluster formation scenario. So from lambda that you compute theoretically and the number of events in the gap, can be the mass gap, can be the spin gap, from those you can find the total number of events in the cluster. From the total number of events in the cluster you can find the mixing fraction, that is how likely is it that my black hole was produced in the cluster as opposed to the standard field formation scenario? And this is basically the game we played. There are errors. The errors come from your measurement of the efficiency, lambda, and they also come from Poisson counting. Uh, it depends on how many events you have. So we put all of these elements together. I don't want to go into the details. They're complicated. But basically what we found is perhaps surprising. First of all, this is something you cannot really do now. You need a lot of events. Uh, we're going to see many more events because the sensitivity scales with the cube. Sorry, the number of events scales with the cube of the sensitivity of the detector and the detectors are improving quickly. However, we probably need third generation detectors to play these kind of games. What is interesting is that with few hundreds of events, you will be able to measure the mixing fraction, how many binaries were formed in the cluster as opposed to the field. And uh, perhaps it's even more interesting that if you believe the spin gap story, the spin gap does actually better than the mass gap at measuring the mixing fraction. And I'll stop here because I, I could go on, but I don't want to bore you. I could talk about Lisa, for example, but I prefer to stop here and maybe we can talk later. Okay, thank you very much. Um, let's, uh, everybody can do their, their virtual claps. Um, that was a, a great talk. Um, we have, uh, I think we'll take about, you know, five or 10 minutes for people to ask questions now. Um, and then also for people who want to get, you know, more down into the, uh, the details, uh, we'll have a follow-up conversation at two this afternoon and I put the link for that uh, in the chat. It was also in an email sent to the, the Astro group. So you can either uh, just jump in or you can, uh, you can raise your hand and I'll call on you. Uh, Javier Roulet already uh, had a, a hand raised. So uh, Javier, why don't you uh, jump in and ask the first question? Hi, thank you. Um, I had a question for uh, 19 or for 12. This, uh, 10 to the minus 3 to 10 to the minus 4 uh, probability of making it from the previous catalogs. Uh, yes. So here the criterion of, or the definition of this rate of events like this one are um, the events in the catalog that lie inside the 90% um, probability for this particular event. Yes. Uh, however, doesn't this number depend on how well you measure the parameters of this event? Yes, it does. All we wanted to do is come up with a very rough ballpark estimate of if you see 50 events, how often are you going to see one that is compatible with the 90% confidence interval in all of the parameters that LIGO measures? I just wanted to have a ballpark estimate because to be honest, uh, there are many people that are playing the game. I see a new event. I'm gonna go back to my model and tweak it to show you that my model could have produced it. But, you know, Jane's probability theory, that's not the way you should do physics. Uh, you should have a model and and uh, you have priors, which you are free to update. Um, but, you know, you can't just go back to the model and readjust it every time. So we want it to be as agnostic as possible. Of course, you're right that if I change from 90% to 68%, um, I'm going to get something different. But we just wanted to get an idea. Is it 1 in 50 or is it 1 in 10,000? Yes, um, uh, my question, I guess, was more, um, suppose uh, this event could have happened in many 
ways. Suppose it had a slightly different chirp mass and then it would be outside the 90%, um, but it would be otherwise astrophysically similar. Right? And then mm -hmm. depending on how well you measure the chirp mass, you may be inside or outside this 90%. True. Uh, it's also true that what determines whether you can make this guy is not so much the chirp mass that we know is measured pretty well. It's the mass ratio and chi effective, which are not measured so well. Yeah, what it's made this, yeah. So what made this event special is that chi effective cannot be zero within the 90% confidence interval, if you believe that I go error bars. And the mass ratio is also very much unequal in the sense that if you look at these numbers on this slide, maybe it's not one third, uh, but it's definitely not close to unity either. So we just wanted to see, can we make it at a rate compatible with the you see, there is also something else that is a little disturbing here, that they selected the special events for announcement, but you should really think of these events as coming from the full catalog of 50 or 60, or I don't know, when you guys go back and look at the data, maybe 100. Um, so they were selected because they are special. But what we just wanted to understand is, are they really special? Should they have been in this catalog if we don't tweak the formation scenarios that we have? And, and this was just a rough attempt at um, estimating how unlikely they should be. Okay, we've got a bunch more hands up. So let's go to um, Roman next. Uh, hi, I'm an, I'm an uh, I have a question about this exercise as you were playing with the uh, globular clusters. Uh, suppose uh, you have some number of uh, binaries, black hole binaries, let's say, uh, sitting in a cluster at the very start. So in the end of your exercise, how, what, what fraction of this uh, number of, initial number of binaries uh, do end up uh, uh, producing LIGO events? Do end so up. This is the plot you want. So I, I don't claim this to be reality, but this is what happens in our model. So you start with 1G plus 1G events. So, the, so what, what is on the vertical axis? You never mentioned what's... Oh, uh, yeah. What this is the total number of events in our catalog, which you can also think of as the total number of events that are going to be detectable by something like Einstein Telescope or Cosmic Explorer. Sorry, this is the so, number of events. Uh, I'm asking uh, like the fraction of the initial number of binaries injected in the cluster. So that's right, right. So 1G plus 1G is our population of binaries in, in the cluster that are going to okay. Okay. yield a merger. Mm -hmm. That's the black line. Then the red line, so notice that the black line is a peak at a mass of the cluster of about 10 to the 6. Why is that? Because if you look at this plot, this is the total time that you get by summing all of these different processes that eventually give you a binary that merges, okay? And uh, this time is minimized by a cluster of mass about 10 to the 6 or so, okay? So if I plot these things, the, the binaries, these are not second generation events. These are just binaries. The maximum number is going to happen at the sweet spot of cluster mass that produces a lot of binaries that eventually merge, okay? So this is the reason for this peak over here. You see my cursor? Yeah. You see it? Mm. My question is, do you get all the forming binaries to merge eventually in your scenario or some- No, um, no, 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 so, no. So what's a fraction of the forming binaries that do merge? Oh, that I don't know because we didn't record it. We were only interested in the binaries that eventually give you LIGO events. Right. Yeah, I don't have that number. Okay. Um, but uh, yeah, so then what you see in red over here is the uh, binaries that merge in situ, meaning that, you know, as the binary shrinks, uh, hard binaries get harder 
by Hegi's law, some of them are going to be ejected. So how many binaries will form a second generation event within the cluster? That's the red. Okay. See? And then you can ask, uh, now to G plus one G, I have to merge again, right? And, uh, but now my 2G event is going to have some spin, okay? And uh, Kai Max tells you the maximum spin of the first generation black holes. So the larger Kai Max, the more binaries I'm going to eject, the fewer second generation events I will get because binaries are not retained. So that's the blue and the dash blue. This is telling you the larger Chi max, the more binaries I will eject by relativistic recoil, the less second generation events I'm gonna see. Okay, let's go to Elias next. Uh, I actually have a question regarding the spin distribution of, of black holes, in particular the lower mass end. I think you were mentioning mentioning this like during the middle of the talk. Like, can you say what is what is known about about that? Like, what spins do we expect for black holes having less than ten solar masses? Are there any constraints coming from the observation so far? Um, I don't believe anything. I'm a skeptic by nature. But I, I so what. There's two stories that are being told by collapsed modelers. One is here. Um, you can look at this paper by Jim Fuller. There is also a follow-up paper. This is Fuller and Matt, then there's a mine Fuller. And uh, they have their own reasons for believing that from collapse, you cannot get large rotation. Um, so if I'm talking to Elias, you know more about uh, numerical simulations on neutron stars than I do. So I want to get out of my element, but um, these collapse simulations are not general relativistic full 3D collapse simulations. So there are lots of assumptions on rotation laws and so on that go into the conclusion that the spin is going to be small. and um, you know, Jim says that he now believes the spins to be small, but I uh, can see other people arguing. And in fact, the model that you see here, this comes from, uh, you can look it up in our paper, I believe this paper, for example, but we also have another paper with Chris Belchinski that this model is coming from. Uh, here, we were using prescriptions from a different group. Um, the refereeing of this paper lasted a very long time because uh, the referees didn't quite agree with those prescriptions. Uh, to be honest, this plot with the very large uncertainties that you see here came from the observation that if you look at these guys, the O1 O2 detections at some point, motivated also by the IAS additional observations, people started thinking maybe the less massive black holes are born slowly spinning and the more massive black holes are not. And so perhaps, uh, sorry, the opposite. And so perhaps uh, you can come up with a prescription that tells you that the final spin of your black hole is a function of mass. There was some evidence that I would claim is not very solid, that if you look at the blue and red and orange points here, maybe you can see the general trend of the spin getting smaller as the mass of the black hole gets larger. Um, I personally do not believe that you can draw too much from a plot like this. So we built a sigmoid with very large errors, but that was the spirit. Okay, I'm gonna give Huang Sheng Chia the last question for this morning and I'll bump Matthias till the afternoon. Um, so Huang Sheng, do you wanna ask your question? Hi, uh, I have a question about the uh, recoil velocity 
of non of the mergers of non-spending binary black holes that you mentioned. I don't want to misquote you, but I think you mentioned something like having an upper bound of twenty kilometers per second or two hundred. Two hundred, sorry, an order of magnitude off. So not too bad. Uh, I'm just wondering, how is this upper bound obtained? In that, doesn't it depend on, for example, the upper mass? Double bound the masses of the black holes they consider, or no, no, it doesn't. That's the beauty of it, and the reason is that in uh, so if you take a black hole binary in vacuum general relativity, the mass scales out of the problem. So you can take a black hole binary and you can compute the recoil velocity due to emission of gravitational waves, and the recoil velocity is a number that you can measure in units of c. And in units of C, as a relativist, I like to use units of C, that number is dimensionless. So what you compute at the end is V escape over C, which doesn't depend on the mass. That's what what about mass ratio, for instance? Um, mass ratio, yes, it matters, because mm -hmm. the mass ratio is a dimensionless sure. quantity. Sure. So sure. what you can do is you can do simulations of a binary black hole with different mass ratios. And people had estimated the recoil before 2005 in the small mass ratio limit because we couldn't do numerical simulations for comparable masses. One of the very first things that they answered when we finally were able to do simulations with comparable masses was how does the recoil velocity depend on the mass ratio? And I can point you to papers if you want you can send me an email where people found that uh, there is a maximum. So your recoil goes to zero when your binary is equal mass. We knew that by symmetry because this and this configuration are the same. And so basically you get no recoil when the uh, binary is perfectly equal mass. We knew that the limit has to be zero in the small mass ratio limit or large, depends on how you define mass ratios because then your radiation is going to zero. So the fact that you have a sprinkler doesn't matter anymore because the water coming out of the sprinkler is going to zero in that limit. So your recoil is gonna be tiny. The question was, where is the maximum and how large is the maximum? It turns out that the maximum happens at a mass ratio of three, GW190412, remember? And uh, it, uh, it is about 175 kilometers per second. I call it 200, but now I can be, the relativist in me will come out and I will give you a third digit. But yeah, that's what happens. Great, well, thank you very much uh, for a terrific talk uh, and, uh, and insightful answers to these questions. And um, for those interested, uh, we'll reconvene at two um, and people can ask for the questions, talk about what they're doing, uh, discussion can go wherever, wherever we want it to go. Um, but thanks very much. That was, that was a terrific inauguration to the series. So, um, Thank you so much for having me.